Hi everyone, and welcome to this session about configuring SQL Server for efficient troubleshooting. The SQL Server setup wizard is better than ever. Now you can configure TimeDB, you can configure your max memory, you can also configure the max DOP option for your instance. That's very, very nice, but that's not enough for efficient troubleshooting. I'm Christophe Laporte and I welcome you to this session. I'm a certified master on SQL Server and I'm also an MVP for 14 years now. You can reach me on Twitter, on LinkedIn and also um, send me an email if you have questions about this session. I'm working on SQL Server since 25 years now and my main focus of area is uh, high availability, performance tuning, and so on. A little disclaimer about the demo you will see in this session. All the files will be available to download on my GitHub and on the website of the DPS. All the scripts are built on top of DBA tools, so feel free to install the module if you want to uh, reproduce all what we are going to see in this session. We cannot talk about efficient troubleshooting without speaking about backups. That's mandatory. You have to be prepared to disaster recovery situation because you can lose your data center, you can also lose, lose your server in case maybe of a crypto locker that will uh, attack you. And your backup strategy must be compliant with your RPO and RTO. It means that recovery point objective, the data you are allowed to lose and the R uh, RTO recovery time objective the time to the time you have to become online again just pay attention to the backup location never never collocate the data and the backup of your databases you have to be sure that the backup are on another storage array or another a storage uh, system than your data. If you are uh, compliant with the three to one strategy, that's okay because you have at least three copy of your backup in, on two different storage systems and one copy is outside of your data center. If it's okay, that's good. So how can we set up an efficient backup strategy? We can use some maintenance plan. If you are using the Microsoft one, that's good, but we can do better than that. Um, because if you are using Microsoft maintenance plan, you cannot reproduce them easily on many, many, many instances. For example, one of my customers have more than 30,000 instances and we cannot use a maintenance plan from Microsoft. So I choose the Ola Allen Grade Maintenance Plan solution. That's almost a standard now, nowadays. You can manage your backup, your, the integrity check, the index and statistic management, and also manage the history in, inside the MSDB database. And set up a maintenance plan will not take more than maybe 20 seconds. That's enough. Let's see that in a demonstration. Uh, just a few recap. All the scripts are uh, based on DBA tools. And if you want to reproduce everything, feel free to download all the script. I just set up my instance using also DBA tools and the command install DBA database. And after I just restore some demo database for the uh, session. So, for the backup, I will just connect to my instance and I will just create a database with some administrative purpose. I will call that underscore DBA database and I just configure the uh, retention, the backup uh, for the backup. Uh, in this case, it is 15 days. I connect to my instance 
and I will just check what is the actual backup directory. Uh, I've not created a specific setup for this instance. And as I said, we have to offload the backup on a different storage array. So I will choose um, um, a file share on my computer, uh, which is called formation. And then I will update the, configure of the configuration of SQL Server and check for that. It's okay. Have now the um, the update uh, folder path for my backups. I will create my dummy database, my DBA database, and after that, I just have to create the jobs and create the storage procedure for the Ola Lundgren maintenance solution. Using DBA tools is very very uh, simple and a smart way to install the uh, procedure. For if we are going to the instance. We can see that we have now a few jobs related to the backup and the uh, integrity check and also the um, history uh, retention management. But none of these jobs are uh, scheduled. There is no schedule inside the, uh, the maintenance solution of um, Ola Lundgren. So I will just create a storage procedure just to be sure that all the steps of my job will be synchronous because by default inside one job, if you are calling different job steps with a storage procedure and other jobs, they are asynchronous. So I'm just creating a procedure to execute other jobs in a synchronous way. And after that, I just have to create my jobs for uh, maintaining my SQL Server, um, how to say that, um, in a good earth. The first one is an housekeeping uh, job. I will cycle the error log and make some cleanup. And I'm just calling all the job of Ola Allengren. And at the end, I'm purging the database mail and to finish, I'm just uh, performing the system backup uh, for the backup for the system database and the integrity check for the system database. I'm just going to run this script. And then after that, we have the user backup databases uh, and integrity check and also the uh, index maintenance. I'm just scheduling one job that calls all over Aula Allengren job. So I've got the full backup with integrity check, index optimize, and database backup, and the scheduling once a week. I've also the difference, the differential backup, which is almost the same. It is planned all over days uh, in the week uh, except the Sunday and I will just perform a differential backup of my databases. And in the end, I'm just taking care about log backups. When it is okay, when it's done, I've got some jobs in addition, and these jobs are the only one that are uh, scheduled, okay? I've got here my schedule, and that's the only job that will be scheduled on my system. This job are just calling all other job from Ola Allengren. That's not perfect, but it will fit almost 80 or 90% of the needs of your instance. Okay, let's continue. Setup SQL Server, the setup of SQL Server is almost better than the past version of SQL Server, but the retention is not well managed by Microsoft. For example, the error log file, that's not very, very um, practical to use the actual uh, setup for Microsoft because you only have one current and six archive file by default. And if you are uh, restarting your instance or if you have a lot of errors and so on, the actual configuration is not very handy to find errors. So uh, that's the same 
with a, a system else x event because the number of the file and the size of the each file is not uh, sufficient to troubleshoot SQL Server uh, issue. And maybe also there are some uh, events that are may, um, that are uh, noisy and it will not be very, very easy to find errors, real re errors inside your system else. That's the same for always on uh, else x event. And also for the log folder, please fo uh, back up the log folder of your instance, uh, especially the TRC files, because if you have some specific issue, you can find, find information inside those files. So to manage the retention, we have some simple script to manage everything. I will also connect to my instance. And the first thing I'm doing, I'm just creating, I'm just configuring SQL Server to have 99 log files. That's the maximum. And in the housekeeping job that I created earlier, uh, I'm just recycling my error log once a day. It means that I have one file per day. So I have an history of 99 days and that's maybe enough to, um, to, to, to find some errors. Please remember that these files are inside the log folder of SQL Server. So if you are backing up this folder, you have a lot more uh, information in the past. Then we can uh, increase the retention inside the MSDB database uh, just because by default your instance will not keep a lot. Uh, I'm sorry, that's a little bit slow on my machine. I will go on to the server. On the SQL Server agent, the history uh, sorry, uh, the history is not uh, well configured because you have uh, a maximum of 100 execution per job and 1000 uh, execution in total. So if you have a job that is uh, uh, scheduled on a very, very, um, very, is scheduled very, very often, you will lose some information about job execution. So we have to change that and we can opt for maybe a maximum of zero. It means that there is no maximum inside the table, or we can opt for uh, 1 million rows. That is the maximum allowed inside the uh, policy. And after that, inside the, my um, housekeeping job, I'm just purging the information uh, after 30 days. So I will just set up that. Then I will just configure the systemers um, X event session just to have more retention about the information because by default we have only 20 megabytes uh, uh, of retention and I prefer to increase the file size and also increase the number of files just to have much more information in by inside my X event. Also, I will remove the error ring buffer recorded event just because it doesn't uh, help you to solve any issue and it is very, very noisy. I do exactly the same for the always on, but if you don't have always on, that's optional. Okay, right now we have everything needed to uh, keep information inside the msdb database inside the error log file and inside the x event so if someone calls you and asks you for an issue maybe one day two days or a week before you have everything uh, to that diagnose if we are talking about issue we might talk about security uh, for authentication, maybe you have some fade logon. And actually, all the logon fade are stored inside the error log. But it can be very, very noisy if you have a lot of uh, pen testing, for example, uh, um, scheduling, or if you have a lot of uh, issue on bad password and so on. 
your error log file will be fill up with logon failure errors. And that's not very, very interesting because we could miss some very important information inside the, the error log. So my advice is just to configure SQL Server to not store the information inside the error log. It said, it is, uh, it said that I will uh, use the known configuration about auditing and I will create either a security audit, audit either a, um, an X event to store those, those information. Maybe you want to track people that change the password or if someone changed the SA password, for example, or any password of any login on your server. You can use the server audit and server audit specification. That's a purpose built um, uh, configuration inside SQL Server. And you can also use your X event if you are more comfortable with. And for authorization, that's almost the same. You can use uh, the server audit specification. Uh, remember the server audit is that it is just the location to store the information about the audit specification. Maybe it is a file, maybe it is inside the application log or the security log of Windows. And maybe you want to store information about the role change. So it is a server audit specification event or maybe inside the database you want to track who is reading or writing um, information on specific object maybe you have some security issue on a specific table or if you want to track if there are some change in permission inside the database so that's very very important to track this kind of if this kind of information because someone could ask for that in the future well, we will see that with a few lines of code. As a way, I'm connecting to my instance and I will just disable the auditing inside SQL Server because I don't want to track the, log, the logon fail events inside my error log. But as a replacement, I will just create a server audit and after some audit specification. So I'm creating my server audit and a server audit is just, um, how to say that, um, uh, a place where we are recording the information. I'm going to security and audits. I've got my security audit here. And after that, we are going to create the audit specification to track login failed or a login change password, for example. Right now, if I have a login fail, I will track that in my specific audit. If you are more comfortable with X event, you can create a similar X event to track those information. Remember that all the script will be available uh, at the uh, end of the session on my GitHub and on the DPS Summit website. And hopefully I also will be able to answer every question live during this session because I use a specific um, TC call command at DBCC clone speaker. So I will be available on the chat also. So my audit is created and I can, uh, my audit and my X event are created. So I will just perform some testing. So I'm using a non-existing login. So I will just have an error trying to connect with this one. Login failed because this login is not existing on my instance, or I can connect with a bad password, for example, for the SA account. If I'm going to check the information inside my security audit, I see that I've got the login failed for my non-existing login. And the reason is could not find the login matching the name provided. And for the next one, I also have the information about the password that did not match uh, the login provided 
is the SA account. So that's very, very interesting to use the security audit for that. If you are more comfortable with X event, feel free to create one and open the login file. You have exactly the same information with the message of your login fade and also the state of your login fade. That's very important to have also the uh, state of the login fade and we will see that in a few seconds. That's very, very important because the error number is always, always the same whatever the condition of login fade is. So the real reason is in the state. We also can create some database audit specification to track access, read and write access to some specific tables. Let's imagine that our table employee pay history is a very sensitive one. So we want to track who, we, who is reading and who is writing information to this table. So I'm just adding a database audit specification on this table and I store the information inside my audit. And then I'm just querying this table. If I'm going back to my audit, I will be able to see that someone performed a select statement on this table. I've got a lot of information. I see the statement or at least the beginning of the statement if it is a very long one. I also see that who is performing this query and I'm able also to know what is the client IP or the client host name of the person who performed the query or runs the query, query and also the application name. So that's very, very important. I don't see the data, but I see all other information about this query. That's very, very important to have this kind of information for sensitive data. Let's jump back to the slides. I say you, I said you that it was important to have the information about the state because having the state of the login fail is mandatory to have the re real reason. And all the state uh, can be seen on my uh, troubleshooting connectivity diagram. I encourage you to download it. It's a, a pretty uh, heavy one. So if you are zooming to this diagram, uh, you will see all the state and all the reason that could bring you to a logon failure. And if you have some logon failure issue, you want to troubleshoot, feel free to use this diagram to help you to, do, to diagnose. And if there is another reason that I do, did not cover with my diagram, feel free to send me an email because I'm very curious of what I'm missing for uh, the login failure reason. So feel free to download this diagram. You've got the link inside the slides and it's also on my uh, GitHub repository. Configuring the DAC and the remote DAC is very, very important. Why? Just imagine that you've got uh, a server that is running at 100% CPU. You can experience some login timeout, even if you are a sysadmin, just because you are using the same scheduler than other uh, user. Or you just imagine that if uh, you create a logon trigger that prevents you from connecting to SQL Server, you have no way to recover this kind of... Uh, you can not remove your logon trigger, so you cannot recover for, from this issue. If you are using the DAC, the dedicated administrative administration connection, uh, you have a dedicated scheduler to connect to SQL Server and to run the queries. You can connect with only one session and it will be used with the admin comma, uh, admin comma um, syntax just before the name of your instance. And using the DAC will allow you to bypass the logon trigger and to bypass the 100% CPU or at least to have a specific scheduler that gives you access to the, to the CPU directly. That's very, very cool. But that's a local 
access. You have to uh, connect locally to the server, to the instance by RDP. And sometimes opening uh, an RDP session is very, very long just because you have 100% uh, CPU on the, on the server. So just because it is a local connection, we can open this connection to remote computer. And I encourage you to open this connection to remote computers. It's open by default on local, but not on remote. That's a famous TCP uh, 1434 port on SQL Server. And this port has to be open on the firewall. And after you have to uh, configure SQL Server to allow connection for uh, remote access. And to configure that, we have also a few lines of PowerShell script command. That's very, very easy to configure. Let's connect also to the instance. And I'm just configuring SQL Server for the remote DAC connection. Right now, I have said to my SQL Server to accept connection from remote computer on TCP port 40, 14, uh, 40, uh, 1434. Sorry. But don't forget to add the cor corresponding firewall on your server. So I'm just creating the firewall rule right now. And let's make something very, very stupid on my SQL Server. I'm, create, I'm creating a trigger that prevents everyone to log on to my server because I have the rollback uh, statement inside my uh, trigger. And the rollback on inside a logon trigger will prevent everyone to log in. Right now, if I'm just creating a new query, I'm getting an error because I cannot connect to my SQL Server instance due to my logon trigger execution. So how can we troubleshoot this? Just by using the admin comma prefix to the name of the, my instance. And right now I'm able to connect. I'm inside my SQL Server and I can see select star from sys dot dm os schedulers that all the visible online schedulers are almost not usable because nobody can connect but right now i'm using this special one the dac and i am in a remote but i, I am connected on the dac uh, scheduler so i have now the opportunity just to drop my stupid trigger and to recover the access for everyone on my SQL Server instance. So opening the DAC on remote connection is very important just because it allows you to avoid using RDP connection and then try to connect to your instance. The next session, the next section is very important because uh, I often heard some customer asking for TimeDB auto grow reason. Why my TimeDB grows? What is the reason? What is the query? By default, there is nothing um, configured on SQL Server. So you have to do that. That's mandatory for me. You can create an X event to track auto growth for data file, for log file. That's important for TimeDB, but you can also create this uh, or extend this X event, X event to uh, track the same information about your user databases. The fun part of this, of this X event is that it returns the guilty query, the query that, that uh, uh, involves the TimeDB autogrow. That's very, very interesting to have this kind of information because it will remain on the server even if you stop the server and restart the server just because it is an X event and we prefer, uh, in this case, store the X event inside a file. To configure that and to demo that, let's jump to the next demo. I'm connecting 
to my instance. That's always the same, but I just copy and paste the, um, the code. And I'm creating my X event, you can call with um, any kind of name, but the information that is very, very important that you have to track the database file size change and the database log file used size change. With those two events, you will track the auto growth for your TamDB. And why it is a TamDB? Just because I create a where clause inside my actions uh, to track the growth for only TamDB database, database equals two, and for user session, by default, it is the, the session ID uh, greater than uh, 50, but in some case, it could be more than 50 on a very, very large, uh, large boxes. I'm creating my X event. And now I see that my TamDB is very, very small, just because of the demo. My TamDB is hosted on four files and each of the files is eight megabytes in size. And I will just copy inside my TamDB the data of one order database, which is almost 200 megabytes. So that will exceed the size of the database, the TamDB database. I'm running this query and now I can reconnect and check the size of my file. My file has increased, all the file has increased in size, okay? Just to handle the volume required to copy the, the data of this table. So if I'm going to my X event, I've got a new one. And for the TamDB autogrowth, I now have, have information about the query, the SQL text. This is a query that involves an increase of the size of my database data file. And why I have four events? Just because if we are going to see the file ID, we have the four data file, just because SQL Server is um, changing the, the file size for all the file at the same time in the recent version of SQL Server. In the past, we have to, to, to add a, a trust flag uh, at, the, at the start, uh, in, inside the start option of SQL Server. So that's very important to create this kind of X event just because we want to track the queries that perform, that involves um, autogrowth on TemDB or maybe on your database, that's important also. Email alerting. Inside SQL Server, we have the availability to send email in case of uh, a job failure for, uh, for an example. So feel free to use this feature. It is built in inside SQL Server. So why don't uh, you use it? So to create this kind of alert email, we have to create uh, and to configure the database mail feature first. We have to create an email account and an email profile just to be sure that we can send an email. And then on inside the SQL Server agent, we have to enable the mail profile and then create operators and then create alerts for some kind of errors uh, for the gravity between 19 and 25 and for specific um, uh, errors on inside SQL Server and also if you want for failing jobs. Creating this email configuration is very also simple using some scripts. The first section is just some configuration, the name of your um, operator, the uh, email uh, and email server you will use for uh, the, the alerting system. And then you have to uh, configure SQL Server to allow 
the database mail um, feature. That's uh, an advanced option. That's why I have to show advanced option uh, set to one, just to be sure that I can access to the database mail configuration. And then I can create the profile and the, data ma the database mail account. The database mail account is just an SMTP address and the profile can use multiple, multiple SMTP address and SMTP server just to be sure to be resilient in case of uh, a failure on the SMTP relay. Then I'm just enabling the database mail on the agent and then create the operators, one operator in this case, and creating the alert for important, uh, very high severity and very important message, uh, mainly for uh, IO disk error in this case. And after that, we can configure uh, some uh, emailing for job that uh, are failing. Maybe we, if you want just to, uh, to, to be warned if one of your maintenance job is failing, you can select your job, set the email level on failure and your email operator for those jobs. And right now, each time one of the jobs, the maintenance job will fail, uh, you've got automatically an email sent to the DBA team operator. That's very, very easy to set up and uh, that's provided with SQL Server, so feel free to use it. If we have a look to the agent right now, we can go to one job and see that you've got the notification uh, configured um, on uh, the email with the email to the DBA team. And if we are looking to the operator, my DBA team is warned for all these errors that we have configured before. Okay, one of the biggest concern of troubleshooting is about performance. And I often heard my customer asking for what is causing the performance issue on my server. So, okay, we can use the wait and uh, queue technique to um, troubleshoot information, but some of this inf information, some of this data are um, bound to the memory of SQL Server. If we stop SQL Server, we have no information about what occurs in the past. So that's very interesting to use DMVs to, and the DA, DMF, the um, data management views and function to troubleshoot performance issue inside SQL Server, but that's not enough. That's why we have to build some specific X event session uh, stored on the disk uh, with uh, files. So uh, just to track performance on the SQL Server. We can track the performance for the long running queries with the RPC completed and the batch completed events as we are doing live when we want to troubleshoot live. But in this case, it will be record. Uh, and if someone asks for what happens yesterday, we have the information with the X event. It's mandatory also to track information about lock because the lock are one of the major issue of uh, performance problems. So we can use some blockhead process report events that's very interesting because we have the query and the resource involved inside the lock, uh, the locking issue. We can also track the lock timeout and the lock waits. And also we can track the deadlock. It's already set up inside the systemers X event, right? But uh, I will prefer to have the all-in-one uh, X event with everything I need to troubleshoot. So uh, my way to configure it is to create my own X event and to remove the systemers from the earth and to remove the deadlock um, capture event capture from the systemers. I prefer to centralize. So creating an event session is very very important for me, and you can use some new 
feature about SQL Server, uh, SQL Server 2016 and earlier, that's the query store. The query store is a database specific feature that tracks all the execution of your queries and your procedure and your trigger and so on. It stores the execution plan and also all the statistics of, about your execution. It means that it will store every information about the resource consumption and so on. It's very, very uh, interesting to use this kind of feature to fix quickly some performance issue. Just imagine and that uh, someone calls you and say that uh, this morning the database is very, very slow. My application is very, very slow. Uh, it was working perfectly yesterday. If you are looking to the query store, you will find some reports that will give you the information that yesterday I used to use this query plan and today I'm using another one. So I can force the plan of yesterday. And that's very, very interesting because you can fix quickly the perform performance issue. That's not something you want to keep in time in the, uh, in the future, just because uh, you have to find the root cause of the plan change, but uh, the user will be happy just because there is um, a resolution about the performance issue. And for migration, that's very, very interesting to use the query store for migration because you can compare uh, just after the migration, you can keep the old compatibility mode for your database. And if uh, you want to upgrade it, you just enable the query store, wait for a few days. And after you change the compatibility mode of your database. And after that, you have some uh, reports that warns you if there are some plan regression uh, just after moving from one compatibility mode to another one. So for migration, I always use the query store for migrations. So it's important to configure both XEvent session and query store for your database. So I'm connecting to my instance. And I will just also install the um, specific storage procedure from Adam Mechanic. We will see that in, uh, in the latest slide of this uh, session. Just because uh, DBA, uh, sorry, uh, the who is active uh, procedure is very, very useful. So please install it on each or your server. That's very, very uh, quick way to diagnose some performance issue because it is an all-in-one procedure that shows you information about uh, DMVs like uh, uh, weights and resources consumed and uh, the session and so on. So that's very important to have this kind of procedure installed on your system. So I am installing it and then I'm configuring SQL Server to track every query that is blocked for more than one second by another query. So that's just a setting of SQL Server. And now I'm creating my XEvent session to track those blocked queries and also to track logs and to track RPC completed and batch completed queries uh, just over 250 milliseconds. Uh, feel free to adjust the, the, the level if it is uh, too much or uh, not enough uh, based on your workload. But create this kind of X event. And as I am using also the deadlock report, I'm just removing the deadlock report from the uh, systemals. Now, I have everything configured on my instance to be able to troubleshoot some performance issue. So my X event is there and ready to record every kind of performance issue that I can have on my system. Not everything, but uh, uh, the major uh, of the main issue. Optionally, you can have some attention uh, events, auto start, whatever you want to track on your system. So I'm going now to create a performance issue.
come on the system, control V and create a new session. So on my first session, let me zoom it a little bit. On my first session, I will create a transaction and update one product. Uh, F5, come on. Okay. And then on another session, I will update another product that's not the same. Right now, everything is okay because I have two different sessions that, has, that are updating two different products and the transaction are still running, they are open. So on my first session, I will try to update the product 500 and 20 and uh, 12. The product is locked by the session number two. So I have to wait. That's a traditional issue. A transaction is open. It is locking one or many records. And I have to wait that the first transaction will commit all or rollback. So if we are going to have a look to our session. Come on, buddy. Let's just verify that the configuration blocked process. Yes, that's true. Okay, we have some data now. So I see that each second, and just because I set up my configuration to track blockade process reports each second, I have information about who is blocking who, what are the resources involved, and what are the uh, queries involved inside this lock issue. We have everything that we want inside the, the, the XML, XML uh, report. I know that the session 68 is suspended. Why? Because it is blocked by the session 93. Session 93 is the blocking process. I have my queries, but if your queries are longer than that, you have just the beginning of the query. But the real cool information inside those. We have the login name, we have the host name, we have the program name, so we can call the people if we want. But also, we have here the wait resource. And the wait resource is something very interesting. Okay, it might be obvious to find what kind of resource it is, but with a little of practice of SQL Server, that's very, very readable. Why? Let's jump back to this one and copy and paste some queries. I can use this kind of query to track the partition which is involved. So the table that is involved in the lock. So this number, the H or BT, bit tree, ape or B3, this H or BT ID is just the number of the partition. And I can find this information here. And after, I've got here some information about the resources, the resource, the key resource that is locked. So if I take this number, I can use some magic uh, query inside, form, uh, inside SQL Server, the fn underscore fislock formatter and using the locking resource, I have the information that is this a product one, uh, 512 that is locked. I can now have a look to the data page and to see something if I want to see something. But I have the exact uh, resource, the exact row that is locked by um, by the queries. So now 
we have just a locking situation. But if I just go to my second session and I run this update on the first uh, product that was updated by session one, I am in a deadlock situation. And one of the two sessions has to be killed by SQL Server but is because there is no solution to this lock. So SQL Server decided to kill the 93 uh, session. And just to be clean, I will roll back on the first one also. And now, if I'm going to check my X event, I should be able to see my XML deadlock report. You have, you are maybe familiar with this kind of uh, of representation of uh, a deadlock. You've got the process that has been killed, and you have also the, the other process. You have the statement, and you also have the information about the resource which was locked, owner mode X or request mode. You the request mode it, it is that uh, it means that the session 93 wants to access this information this resource and it's not possible to acquire a update lock just because it is owned by the other um, by the other uh, session sorry so. If we are going to the details, the XML code, we've got again a lot of information and we've got the resource, exactly the same information. We've got the partition, a heap or B-tree ID, and also the resource that is locked. And we can find this information for the two queries. Okay. We see the first one that we saw earlier, and now that's the other um, the other uh, product that we tried to uh, to update. So, okay, I've to close one of these guys. Okay, so I can find the table. That's the exact same queries that uh, earlier, and I can also find the records. I have two records now, the, fifth, the 512 and the 722. That's my two records that I try to update. But I can have some information because maybe you are wondering what are this information, where I can find this information, the, uh, the hash key value. We call that the hash key value. So I will use the DBCC page command just to have a look to this data page that is containing the uh, product 512. And if I'm going to read information about the data page, I'm cracking the data page, I can find my first slot zero, my first uh, record inside the data page for product 512. And if I'm going down to the end of my record, I should able to see my hash key value, which is the one that we saw earlier. So the hash key value is a very important thing because it's a kind of hash that will, in theory, uh, redirect to a single record. And maybe you have some issue with hash key value collision. Uh, it could occur when you are uh, performing join between tables. You have the information here. So that's very important to create the uh, specific X event session. And the next one is about the query store. Please, if that's that's not consuming a lot of uh, a lot of resources on uh, on your uh, on your instance. So feel free to. Uh, enable the query store on the main database that you have to track performance. So right now I have no query store created and uh, configured on my in on my um, instance 
and my database. So I will just enable the query store on all the database, exclude the system one and then and excluding the, and excluding my DBA database because that's not very important to have that. I'm enabling the query store and then right now the query store is enabled on all the user database of my uh, instance. I have not a lot of time to perform the end of the demo to just play with the query store, but all the code is provided. So feel free to use it and to try it by yourself. But that's very important to be sure that everything is configured and well configured on your instance. I talk about the Adam Mechanic SP with Active Procedure. That's a very, very nice combination of the traditional DMVs and DMFs that you are using for the session, query text, execution plan, the weight, the resource consumption, and the lock, and so on. A lot, a lot of information. And sometimes using this procedure is very, very fast to find the root cause of the error. For example, I use the query the procedure and I find that, sorry, and I find that one query was running for one day and 19 hours and 51 minutes and so on and so on. So I just have to call the people and ask why the query was running, still running and uh, consuming a lot of resources on my system. There was no looking for this one, but it was consuming a lot of resources. So this kind of procedure is very, very useful, but sometimes it's a little bit slow if there are a lot of lock inside on your system. So uh, please uh, know all your DMV and DMF to uh, be quick to troubleshoot, to troubleshoot a lock issue. Okay, as a conclusion, because we are almost done, um, all the scripts I give you are not perfect. That's not perfect for sure, but it will cover the most of the situation you have to, to deal with in your professional life because uh, you have to worry about uh, growth of database. You have to, to, to deal with performance issue. You have to deal with security issue. So feel free to download the script, adapt to your own environment, run them and start troubleshooting issue. Thanks a lot and thanks to our sponsor for uh, this kind of events. Thanks to the Data Platform Summit for organizing such an event. It was a pleasure for me to, uh, to be with you. Thanks again and uh, feel free to ask the question inside the chat. I will be there to answer every question. Thanks. <music>